Welcome, Liz. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to having a great conversation. Yeah, me too. Um, so maybe before we start, you can tell a little about you, what you do, and maybe even how you got into that. Yeah, sure. So um, I actually qualified as a veterinary surgeon um, in 2011, and I worked in clinics for six years. And then I worked in um, a corporate organization as a director, large veterinary corporate for three and a half years. And, and how did that go? Like, how, what is it? What does that job entail? So it was pretty, it was pretty heavy going. Um, a lot of clinics, a lot of staff, there was 350 staff that I was looking after. Um, lots of different cultures, lots of different micro cultures. Um, the veterinary world is um, quite sort of famous for um, difficult cultures. It's a really high intensity job. Um, a lot of mental health problems as well. And then there's all the, the business side of it as well, the people side and the business side, you know, ultimately the, the business is there to make money. So and when you're working in a service industry such as veterinary, it's, you know, the, the values that people have on the ground and the values of a private equity company that back the organisation are very, very different. Yeah. And so my role was very much in between those two sets of values really um and it was yeah it was really tough and then when lockdown happened it was there was no um boundaries for me I'm I was very bad at you know putting myself you know anywhere near the top of the list my team came first my people came first and it ultimately led to to burnout and it came to a point at the end of last year where I thought, okay, what do I really enjoy doing? I thought about going back into clinics, um, but I left, you know, I left clinics for a reason. And actually the things that I loved doing in my job were the leadership, the coaching, the culture work. And, you know, there is so much more that we can you know, as leaders can do. Um, and then the, the, the setup of the company was that there were lots of different businesses and partnership businesses within the organization. So I did a lot of business coaching and leadership coaching um, with the, the owners who were often amazing vets yeah. um, and very good at sort of running a practice, but the leadership side, they weren't naturally you know, natural born leaders, some of them. So, and so I decided to take that and, you know, make that my, you know, my business and my world. And I am just coming to the end of my studies with Henley Business School um, in executive coaching. It's uh, quite a long course um, and it's pretty heavy going, but I've absolutely loved it and really start, starting to, to find my feet with with the sort of official um coaching sort of practices um so that's sort of where I've where I've got yeah. to now and using you know my experience and my knowledge so I'm a bit of a perpetual learner I've just done my MBA essentials as well and using the knowledge and the experience together to help organizations and help individuals with their leadership um, and their culture. Yeah. Um, what you said about business and people, I think that's that's something that the, that's a lot of times a challenge to balance them, where it doesn't go too much to where you focus only on business and everybody is a number. But then again, if you go to personal, then that's like another extreme. So how you find balance between them both, where you get the best out of both of them and you don't like get too focused on one or the other yeah that's a, that is a real you know thing to balance and it's all about the culture that you have and the values that you have and having them aligned with your team and your business 
and having, you know, right back to the basics of business, of your mission and your vision and your core values and having the team aligned to those so that you are focused on the same thing. And if you get that right, it's easy to balance because you're always working and you're all working together towards the same thing and the same and the same outcome so how you how you create first how you come up with those values and how you actually incorporate them in the culture because i think that's like well yeah we know our values but how you actually bring them in your culture how you actually create this culture the the key mistake that people make is telling people what the culture is. Yeah. <laughs> and I've been in companies where I've been told what what the culture is and it doesn't work. You know, you can't dictate what a culture is. And it's about understanding your your teams and your people and what they value and what they enjoy about the organization, what they don't, what, you know, the reasons that they're there, their purpose and their mission as well. And I mean, ideally you want to figure this out before you grow your business, but if we were going in um, to do um, culture work, we first get um, a really deep understanding of where the leaders and the owners of the organization believe their culture to be oh yeah and then the employees ex and current and what they believe the culture to be and often there's quite a misalignment there yeah and you know getting it right first is the best way to go because realigning a mismatch of culture takes effort and it takes time but it can be done but there has to be true buy-in from the leaders and the owners of the business. Because if you say, okay, we want to improve our culture and you get people in and it's more of sort of a surface attempt to show that you value your people, then it won't work either. It's got to come from the top of the organization and you know, um, there's a famous article um, from the CEO of um, a financial services organization in 1990, and he did a massive culture change. And he estimated that it would take five years for the culture change, and it actually took 10. So it's well, not, the, I mean, was that's it like, a huge... How big size was of the company that they were... Huge global organisation. Oh. So, you know, it's a lot easier on, on a smaller scale, but it does take time. And that, you know, and that's where people need, that's what people need to understand. You can't change your culture overnight. You can't dictate what your culture is. And, you know, if you can do it from the beginning... And when you're, you know, start up businesses, know what your mission, know what your vision is, know what your core values and recruit people who embody those. Yeah. And if you're further down the line, you've got to really be committed that that's what you want to do and really listen to your people. Yeah. That what you said about the, I have like two part questions. So first one is when you, how you create that or come up with those core values or mission and also how what is the recruiting process because I think I don't remember who said it but it was Brian Tracy or John Maxwell that um, hire slow and fire fast so like how how what would be like good way how to approach the hiring process where Mm -hmm. you actually because like especially when you start off well I think at any point but let's say when you start off because that's pretty much like the first people you get in they will be the ones who will be like the the base of the culture that you're building so how what's the good way how to approach that process so I think there's a lot of um sort of importance 
placed on a CV and on paper. And yes, people have to have a set skill set, expertise. But when you have decided that, yes, they tick those boxes, the interview process needs to be a great conversation. And I work with a lot of clients who are um, in a transition of their career and going through interview processes. And I say to them that it needs to be on a level playing field, a great conversation with mutual respect to really understand, okay, does this organization have a great culture? Do they have the same core values and do they embody that in what they do? And from the interviewer point of view, that's how you need to approach it. No. That it's not, you know, prove to me why you want to work, work with us. Prove to me why you're good enough. It's got to be okay. I can see that you've got the skills, the expertise, the qualifications. Now let's have a real conversation about what your values are, how you want to work, what boundaries you put in place know what you value in an organization and make that alignment and I think that's where the balance in interviews is is wrong yeah so mainly the the interviews are based on your knowledge or things like that and not as much on the person you are I think so and you know I've been through various um promotion and interview processes and it was very much um, okay, so here's some P&Ls and I want you to go away and then come back with a, a business plan and what would you do, etc. And those things are definitely important, yeah. but actually asking questions around people's values. And I talk about values all the time because yeah. they're so important. And, you know, what they are looking for in an organisation because if they're looking, if they value something completely different from your organization, if they are not going to be aligned to your vision, then they're not the right person, regardless of whether they've got all the expertise and knowledge that you're looking for. And it needs to be more of a paper exercise. And it's not just whether you get on with the person as no. well. So, you know, as an interviewer, you can go in and you can go, yeah, we got on really well and the conversation flowed. But what team are they actually working yeah. in? Who are the people that they're going to be leading? Who are the functions that they're going to be, you know, interacting with? And do they fit with, with them? Yeah. And I think, you know, really spending the time in an interview to really understand, you know, understand that. And I think the other mistake that people make is they have a lot of interviews on one day. And one of my clients had an interview um, and he was uber prepared. He'd done a presentation. He's been doing a lot of really great work on himself and he was really ready for it. And it was at the end of the day and he said they just looked like they checked out and they were exhausted and they'd had enough They'd been interviewing all day. And that's that's not good enough. Yeah. You know, it's you've got to really take the time to understand that person and really value each hire that you that you make because your people are your biggest asset. Yeah, I think it's it might even come back like let's say with like leadership, understanding the um, real value of leaders. I was reading, uh, I think it was called Simon Sinek's book, Infinite Game, where he was telling about the, that the, it's the importance of, well, he's talking about a, lo a lot about the importance of your people and actually understanding that, um, well, even like the difference between the boss and the leader, that you're the one who is like, well, it's your responsibility, whatever they do, it's your responsibility. And I think like one challenge that some leaders might have is and I have had it with some people that I have worked with um it's ha setting boundaries where you are pushing them but at the same time they know that you care so like setting kind of having this 
in a way friendly relationship but at the same time you're the one who is their mentor you're pushing them um and you want them to respect you as well so like how would you approach or suggest people to approach that are like in leadership positions um to to where like they they get because i have had many people that have said to me like i don't want to be this person that everybody's hating like i need to push them but i know they will not like it <laughs> so how to find that balance where even like you are okay with them not liking you if that's something that's necessary yeah so that is all about adaptability of leadership style and being keenly aware of the different um styles of all of your team members and if you understand their drivers how they like to be communicated with what motivates them and you speak to them and lead them on that level you will get the best out of them yeah and the biggest mistake people make is okay i'm this kind of leader <laughs> and i'm going into an organization and here's yeah. my team and this is the way i lead because you know chris over here in financing and mandy over here in accounts they don't want to be led the same way no. and you know you can embody all of the um you know great things about a great leader but it may not be right for each individual and yeah. i'll give you um an example so i did a lot of um i'm i'm a huge fan of psychometrics and um some people are some people aren't um but i've done a lot of work on on psychometrics and I love insights. I'm not insights qualified, so I'm not no. pushing pushing this particular. There are other ones like DISC, etc. But essentially, I had a line manager a few years ago, and I like to chat. I like to build that relationship. I like to talk. You know, you just got back from holiday. How was your holiday? You yeah. know, what did you get up to? What was it like? And we did the insights profiling. And as soon as I understood about different leadership styles, it clicked into place. So I'm a, a green or green yellow, which is um, I'm very much about the, the people, the teamwork, and I'm my least styles are analytical and directive. Yeah. So he is a very high red, which means he doesn't want to talk about his holiday. He wants you to come in, tell him what's going on. He'll give you the answers and then leave because he's on with the next yeah. thing. And it just clicked to me that, you know, he was very pleasant and, oh, it was good. And da, 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 but that's not how he, you know, wanted to, to lead. And it's not how he, um, you know, worked yeah. so I adapted and this is this is upward influence leadership I adapted my style that when I went in it was boom 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 boom, boom. thank you so much I'm off and he's yeah. on to the next thing and it was amazing how that relationship sort of moved to the next level because I was adapting with him yeah and I did a lot of work with um, uh, what we call branch partner of, of mine in the in the last corporate role, and he was a good manager. He knew his accounts. He, you know, could recognise strategic management decisions. His leadership style was not adaptable and it was not flexible. And the problem was that he was working with um, a lot of younger females who were veterinary nurses or training to be veterinary nurses and they worked very much on an emotional level these particular um nurses and he just didn't understand that he's like well why are they crying i don't i don't understand you know they need to get over it and move on and explaining to him that this is how they work this is how they want to be led they want you to ask them how they are and ask them how, you know, their wedding was or 
you know, anything big in their life and they want to talk about it. You may think, well, there's no time and it's, you know, we've got to get on with our work, but you will get the best out of those people and build the best relationships by communicating with them in the way that they want to be communicated with and leading them in the way that they they will respond best to. Yeah, I think so even like with understanding the, um, when it comes to leadership, for you to be like, it's pretty much like what you said, that for you to be able to lead people and get the best out of them, you have to understand what works on them, like on each person specifically. But like how, let's say you had over 300 people to that you were in charge with, how you manage them then or how do you approach it when you have like big team? Because then you, you're not talking to each person like one-on-one on a daily basis. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the way that, I mean, I had direct reports and they then had their direct reports. And so it, and so it went on and it's about upskilling your direct reports. If they are leaders themselves and how to lead their team members and how to lead their team members and, you know, bringing in a coaching mindset, understanding leadership and equipping, you know, your direct reports with the skills Um, and the understanding to pass that on and to pass that throughout the entire organization so i hope that no one would be direct the direct report for for 300 people i had i had 350 people in my team but you know they it was you know leadership sort of um you know teams throughout um and it was really about embedding that behavior yourself and upskilling your direct reports to pass that on throughout throughout their team but it's along with that it's the culture that you create within that team so although um you know certain nurses or head nurses were not my direct reports i would still um know what's going on know who's got you know things they're facing, challenges they're facing, who's excelling, you know, and I would constantly be updated, you know, about the key issues with the people through my direct reports and, you know, being keenly aware of those things so that if you do need to step in and have a conversation that's not necessarily your direct report or pick up the phone and ask how they are, then you can do that because you've got for want of a better non-corporate term, your finger on the pulse of, you know, what's what's going on. And, you know, I knew the name of every single person in, in the 350 team. And so it is possible. And, you know, not straight away. I was there for nearly nearly four yeah. years. But, you know, if, if one of my area managers said to me, um, Sarah Jones is struggling with, you know, mental health um, and stress and these issues, I would know exactly where they worked and I would know, you know, who their team were and then ask them, you know, okay, well, you know, what's the best way to approach her? What do you find works? Do you think that it's right that, you know, will she want me to pick up the phone and ask how she is? Because some people don't want the senior director you know getting involved but you know you don't have they don't have to be your direct reports but you can still have an awareness of of your people and something that I did every single week on a Friday was send um, an email to the entire um, team and celebrating everybody's successes so if somebody had recently passed their nursing exams, if somebody had got their internal medicine certificate, if somebody had passed, you know, mental health um, first aid training, and it would be celebrating them, you know, to, to everyone. And that that really sort of shows the team that you, you may not be there on a daily basis, but you're aware of what's going on and you're proud of, you know, their achievements and, and really celebrate them. And, you know, that comes from the relationship that you have with your direct reports and your leaders that you're leading. Yeah. You know, what's going on? Who are we celebrating? Who do we need to support? 
um, and just having that that awareness is is so important. So how you not lose that? Um, let's say you have people under you, and then there are people under them, and people under them. How you not lose the quality of the work you do with people under you? Because I think many times, especially when people start to hire others. It's and I have seen this with several people that it's really hard to start to delegate because you know you're really good at what you do and you know you can handle it. But it's and I have seen this so many times that it's so hard to to start to trust somebody else to take this job over. So how what is a good way to approach this? Because I think this is pretty big challenge for many people when they start to like have to delegate or they just can't handle all the all the work they have to do. Delegation is tough. I found that myself. I'm um, a bit of a control freak. Um, And, you know, I I have, as everyone does, they have their own ways of doing things. They have a standard that they want to to achieve. And it's very easy to get into the mindset of, I'll just do it myself because then I don't have to check it and and it gets done. And that is a fast way to reach burnout trust me (laughs) so it's all about having trust in your team and the way you get trust is by hiring the right people building those relationships and developing the capabilities of your people because what often happens in organizations all too common is that you hire somebody and then off you go see you later and then the next conversation that you're having with them is six months down the line when they've made an error and actually where was their you know the personal development reviews where were their um you know feedback feedback is so important and timely feedback because again all too often um an error or you know somebody's done something not not the way you want it comes to light and then it's three weeks down the line when you bump into the corridor that it gets raised. And actually, that should be picking up the phone going, I just noticed this. What's going on? You know, do you need help? Do you need, you know, development? And, you know, there, there will ultimately, you know, come a time with teams where you hire the wrong person or they feel that the organisation is not right for them and that you know those things will happen but letting somebody go off and then going okay that didn't work off you go let's hire again is doing a disservice to your organization but to that person as well because you know you join an organization and I'll give you an example but um a, a colleague of mine few organizations ago um had had no personal development reviews and had been hitting the targets and a long way down the road there was well you're you're not doing your job properly and this this and this and this and this came to light it's like okay well that was nine months ago and nobody spoke to me about that at the time and I always say you cannot change your behavior or the way you do things if you're not aware that a change is needed yeah and you're you're doing them a disservice and so many managers hide their head in the sand because they don't want to have a difficult conversation and oh, okay it's just a little error i'll just fix it it's better than having to have a conversation with them oh i'll fix it and then they go okay you've made they've made so many mistakes that they've got to go yeah. It's like, okay, well, where was the feedback? Where was the opportunity for them to develop and do things better? And if you do that and you lead your teams, you hire the right, right people, you, you know, build on their capabilities, you support them in their development, you will have built that trust in yourself to let them run with it. And they will know that if then it's not right, they will get timely feedback and develop and grow in that way until you can pass more and more and delegate more and more um, 
whilst being keenly aware not to overload with delegation yeah. um, because if you're an excellent delegator um, then you need to, you need to just question are you delegating too much onto your people and that is you know it happens it's happened to me um, where you know I'm a yes person and I want to do great and I'll do it that's fine you've asked me to do it I'll do it you know and then you get to a point where the sort of files have piled up to here and and you know steam's coming out of your ears and it's it's too much so having those open and honest lines of communication are really important as well you know are you okay with with doing this project do you have enough time what else have you got going on yes i'm absolutely fine i've got this going on but i can prioritize this great if you need any help just let me know yeah and then checking in yeah go ahead and then just checking in yeah um what do you say about um with like i think another thing is that when you hire people if and i have said this to some people that i have worked with is that if you don't trust them they will know that they will see that you're checking on them so at some point it's it's pretty much like in relationship with anybody like you if you feel like they don't trust you it's really hard to actually go and do or be by yourself and do your work because you know that they will keep checking you all the time, which is another thing is that I think it comes back to you in um, with like believing in them. If you believe in them, you are not going to not trust them because you will give them all they need or you will go and support them. Um, Or even like the fact that you care for them to get better. It's not about you or your business. It's about them getting better. Um, in a way it's like being um, selfless Um, and another thing about the firing I think is that when they make mistakes well if you fire them they will come next person who will do the same mistakes like (laughs) you will just go all over it again Um, and that might be another thing is that when somebody comes in the company and they straight away get this feedback um, even if it's harsh but they learn that okay this is mistake I better go and tell somebody that I made mistake rather than hide away from it or be judged or then they call me out in front of everybody and things like that. I think understanding um, some sort of psychology behind people is pretty important because then let's say if somebody makes mistake and you call them out in front of everybody, now everybody is afraid to make mistakes and they will not tell anybody until you will you will just have to run around and try to figure out who made mistake because nobody wants to be the person who made mistake or is called out and things like that. Absolutely. And I mean, we touched on two, two um, topics there, micromanagement and also, you know, the this goes back to the, the culture and having honest and open lines of communication and knowing that your line manager or your team members will give you that timely feedback that if something's you know missing or misaligned or wrong that they'll you know let you know and you know it's building that culture that it's okay to say I got this wrong I'm really sorry I've got this wrong I know where I went wrong and I'm going to fix it or I you know I'm going to get somebody to help me fix it and that is the, the open and honest culture that people need need to have so that people feel comfortable to admit when something's gone wrong. Because we're all human. Yeah. You know, we 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 all make mistakes. And you know, I've I've made an error in judgment. I've tried something, it's not worked. I've held my hands up and gone, you know, we tried this, it didn't work. That's my error in judgment. And this is what we're going to do about it moving forwards. And as a leader, being receptive to that. But if somebody yeah. comes to you and admits they've made a mistake, you don't whack them around the head and send them packing. You, you know, accept what's happened and you work out how to move forwards. Now, obviously, if you're a, you know, Fortune 500 company and somebody's lost, you know, um, a billion pounds um, by by making a massive error. That's a different that's a different situation. But having that that culture that it's 
okay to, to, to get things wrong as long as you recognize that and you put it right. And if you, and you don't, don't repeat have... it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Every opportunity is a, a learning, you know, is a learning opportunity or every mistake is a yeah. learning opportunity. Um, and that's where innovation comes from. Because if people are terrified to get things wrong, terrified to make a mistake, then they're not going to innovate. They're not going to think yeah. of new ways because innovation, you get mistakes. Yeah. You know, you, you do, you don't, but you adapt from it and you grow from it and you change, you know, that and you learn from it. So if you develop that culture where, you know, people are scared to make mistakes and they've got to keep within, you know, these lines and, and this is what you need them to do. They're not going to come up with new new ideas and new ways of thinking. And the other thing that we touched upon is micromanagement. And there are sort of two reasons for micromanagement. One is the person is creating lots of errors and doing things wrong and you know continually and needs to have that overseeing but then what is the manager doing about that how are they supporting them how they're building their capability and the other reason is because the manager doesn't understand leadership and different ways of of leading people and you know, there are certain people who do want to be micromanaged. I personally, it would be my worst nightmare. Um, but, you know, there are some people who want constant feedback. They want constant, you know, checking off, constant guidance. So how you approach those people? Like, how you lead them? It's building their confidence. That, you know, I looked at you've done this yeah. 10 times now and every time it's been correct you know do you feel that you can do this on your own now and then just come to me if if there's an issue yeah and building their own confidence to be able to have that autonomy and autonomy is is one of um you know the the, the drivers to people enjoying their work mastery purpose autonomy and if you have the right culture and you develop and support people and recognize where somebody needs a bit more support but you build their confidence up and they know that if they get it wrong they're going to get that timely feedback that will build autonomy within them and so, like, okay go ahead <laughs> No, and I was going to say, and, and and leaders who or managers who micromanage um, need to um, realise or understand why are they not capable? Do yeah. I not trust them? Am I just a control freak? And, you know, because it takes a lot of work to micromanage somebody. You yeah. can free up a like lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly so there's two sides to micromanagement and it's recognizing where the misalignment has has come and I would say to somebody you know if you are being micromanaged and that is not you know how you want to be led and how they're going to get the best out of you have a conversation with them and say you know this is this is how I would like to be led. Is there something that I'm not doing right? You know, is there, um, would you like me to get more development or just ask for a personal development review? You know, when was your last development review and have that conversation. And, you know, because if you don't and you carry on and you're continually micromanaged, you will get to a point where you've had enough. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it, it depends on, either the the leader is the one who is micromanaging too much or it's the person who just needs them all the time so like I think even like what I think it takes a lot to and I have had conversations with people where they are afraid to go to their leaders and ask them something or tell them something um 
So I have what would be a good way how to approach it where you need like you need to ask something to the leader or you're not happy with something or you see something that can be changed, but um, it might not be in alignment with what they believe in. Because I think another thing with what you said about innovation is that sometimes some some leaders might not even be open to things changing um, or they might not be able able to see those things. So some people that have ideas that might be afraid to actually go to them. So what would be a good way how to approach it where you have idea or some innovation, but you don't know if they'll be open to that or you have something that you want to go to them, but you don't know if their reaction would be too good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's about upward influence and, um, you know, managing upwards. And that's a, that's a really difficult thing to master. It's not easy at all. And I think work on your relationship with your leader. And, you know, if you're not having those regular catch-ups, regular check-ins, regular reviews, ask for them. Yeah. Say, you know, can we, you know, I'm really keen to do the best job I can. I'm really keen to, you know, build my capabilities, to stretch myself, to really help the organization and our teams move forward really appreciate it if we could perhaps have a chat once a month to see how we're doing or we haven't had a pdr in you know six months i'd really appreciate you know that time and just start building that relationship and that trust between both of you to be able to bring things you know to the table and it's it's not always possible yeah you know you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a leader change overnight um, or a manager um, change overnight. And, you know, I know people who have fear of their boss or can't talk to them, can't bring things to the table. And sometimes you will get to a stalemate. Mm. And maybe that's not, you know, if you're if you're a true innovator and you are being managed by somebody who's not open to those ideas and the culture isn't right, is that the right place for you? Yeah. Yeah, I think it takes a lot of courage to do that. Well, as you said, it, it really depends on the relationship you have with the leader um, and the leader itself. Um, but I think even like what you said about being under stress, when you feel like you, you can't really go to them or they might be like brushing you off. Um, and that comes into like mental health and how important is mental health in the, the workplace um, and in life in general. But there's a lot of stress that comes from um, work, whether you have your own business or you have like your job. Um, so like what would be, maybe what are the main mental health challenges that you have seen with people or like you have seen with yourself I think one you mentioned was the burnout um and like how, how, what would be like good ways to deal with them so burnout is a real issue at the moment I mean I actually did um a webinar last week on mental health in the workplace and talked quite a bit about burnout having experienced it myself and working with clients who have luckily recognized early, early into burnout that that's where they are and taken a step back. Because once you get into the, the latter stages of burnout, you reach breakdown and serious mental and physical illness will ensue. So for yourself, recognizing where you are where your stress levels are and another thing that I talk a lot about is boundaries and with the hybrid teams and working from home boundaries have disappeared they've not just blurred they've disappeared and working 24 7 and no switch off will lead to burnout and so it's so important to create those boundaries, recognize where your boundaries lie and stick to them. 
And that's really, really tough, especially dependent on the culture of your organization. But what is great is we're seeing this move now of organizations to recognize mental health, to recognize the challenges of working from home, recognizing the challenges of, of, of hybrid teams. And there's a lot of talk around it, which is great because mental health in the workplace has been ignored for far too long. And COVID has really brought mental well-being and mental health to, to the surface and people are starting to talk about it. Um, and what's important is that you take action. Yeah. You know, you can talk about it all day long and how important it is, but take that action. And in, as a leader or as an owner of an organization, encourage your employees to set boundaries and help them stick to it because really high achievers and those key people in your organization who have that drive, that ambition, who really, you know, work at pace, watch out because those are the ones that will let their boundaries slip. Yeah. What would you say to a leader that is like, well, what do you mean I have to tell them to set boundaries? Like they're working for me. What if I need them now? And they they can't, they set their boundary and they can't come in. Like, um, what did you say to them? Like, because I think some some people, they might be like, well, yeah, set boundaries, but not towards the business <laughs> or like us, you know? Um, so what yeah. do you say to approach it? I think there's got to be flexibility around it. And it completely depends on the role and the organization that you're in. And, you know, in veterinary medicine, boundaries are lovely. But if there is a patient that comes in yeah. as an emergency, it doesn't matter who you've got dinner booked with or what webinar you're supposed to be going to or your theatre tickets, that patient is the priority. And so, and, and people in the, in the um, veterinary industry recognise that and they know that from the outset. And, you know, they've gone into veterinary for a reason. And... Um, I've never met anybody who would prioritize um, anything over the life of a patient. So you've got to have that flexibility. Yeah. But, you know, if you can, if, you know, if you organize and you structure and you recognize, you know, they want to leave by X time today and we figure our day out around it and we, we let that happen. We make that happen for them. And but with flexibility, you've got to have flexibility because some last minute project will come up, some last minute emergency will come up and, you know, that will happen and you have to be, you know, able to deal with those things. Yeah. But if you're structured and you're organised and, you know, you're not overworking people and you're recognising, you know, people's workload, you can put boundaries in place and you can respect them and what's really interesting is in my previous um one of my previous organizations the new um i don't want to say job title um the new senior director um who was my line manager came into the organization and she said, and I, I, you know, never, I'd never heard this, you know, come about. And she said, I want to put um, my children to bed at seven o'clock. I want to do their bath at 6.30. I want to put them to bed. I want to read them a bedtime story. So I will not be available between half six and half seven in the evening. And I want to have breakfast with them and take them to school. So between half eight and half nine in the morning, I will not be available. Yeah. Outside of that, as, as she will. And I thought, wow, you know, she is really leading. You know, she is setting the example and leading by example. And she, you know, embraced people's priorities. And there were other, you know, working mums and dads who wanted that, that time protected. There are, you know, she said, if you want to go to the gym between 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock in the day, that's, you know, do it, build that in and protect that time because the sky is not going to fall down if you go to the gym for an hour, you know, and 
that actually can help really, you. It was really, I've never worked somewhere. Yeah. I'd never worked somewhere or had a leader who led by example in that way, because we all think the best leaders are the ones who are, or the best managers are the ones who are working at 3 a.m. and pinging off emails at this time, and they're constantly working and they're so dedicated. But actually, that is not the way to lead. Lead by example that it's it's important to have a life outside of work. And, you know, I said to, um, I'm working with um, a client who is a very high achiever. And she has um, been on maternity leave and is now working out how the corporate world fits in with that and how she's changed and how boundaries have changed. And, you know, it's, it's about, um, I lost my train of thought there, but it's about, you know, recognizing um, what's important to you and, and sticking to that and embracing that. Are you, let's say, one thing is that you have like really- big... Sorry, I remember what I was gonna say. Yeah, go ahead. What I was gonna say is, um, and I said to her, you cannot bring your best self to work if you're working 24 yeah. seven. And that is absolutely true. And, you know, when I had, you know, my most productive day was Monday because I'd had time out and I'd done other things. And then I was refueled, recharged and good to go. And by the latter stages of the week where you've had four hours sleep a night and you are responding to those, you know, emails at 5 a.m., it's, you can't, you're not going to do your best work and you're not going to be giving your all. And so for an organization, for the benefit to them is that, you know, letting people and encouraging people to have those boundaries means that they can give more of themselves yeah. to the organization, the time that they're there. Yeah, I think it's, it's very true. And I had like a few episodes back, um, somebody on a podcast we were talking about it was Lindsay Werner and we were talking about self-love and how and I was asking her like what do you say to people that say that they don't have time for that um which is like a lot of people even like myself I was like a few years back I was like working up to 50 hours full-time university training and then I was learning digital marketing on the side so like there was a lot of things that I was doing um and like that's that's where I it took me a while to learn that that's not the best way to do it um, because at some like you can you can go for a while but then there's some point where you're just like you can't keep up with that um, or more like your nervous system just can't keep up with that because we are not meant to be like working 24 7 or like not sleeping and things like that um, but I think like it's I call it the selfish time where you find time usually I tell like if you don't have one hour a day just for yourself or doing something that you love, then you have to look at your life and maybe think about something to change because it is really important to have that time for yourself or um, doing something that you love and enjoy that doesn't have to be something work-related. Um, it can be exercise, it can be spending time with your kids and things like that, but it's something that's, which is another thing that I you might touch on is the importance of actually getting your head out of the work and not focusing 24 seven on the work because in a way it clouds your thinking um or you, you can't even come up with some ideas so like how what would you say is the importance of that or even like with the priorities that many people think like yeah I set my priorities I set my boundaries but then everything starts to feel important <laughs> so. okay so I cannot recommend highly enough the video by Stephen Covey of Big Rocks and Sand. Okay. And it is, it's, I send it to all my clients because it's so, it's a visual exercise of if you fill your life bucket with sand, so all of the the noise, the emails, the, you know, all of the constant things that you have to do, the big rocks of family time, being a mother, education, learning more, exercise, 
eating well, you know, all of these things, whatever it is, you know, dance lessons or playing the piano or things that, that make you who you are, you can't get them in. No. But if you put them into the bucket first, you can get all of the sand around it. Mm. It's a fantastic video. Um, and I absolutely love Stephen Covey. I think he's amazing. Um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People as well. Recommend that really highly. I don't get any money. <laughs> this is not a paid advertisement. <laughs> it's something that I truly believe in. And it's about getting that in first and building that as to when when you're going to do it and when you're going to prioritize it and then having that flexibility around that and what's interesting is that I um you know and I'm saying all these things about building these things into your life and and, and prioritizing these things and I I was very bad at it um I was and it, it led to burnout so um you know, it is easier said than done, but I got married nearly two years ago and three months before the wedding, I decided that I was going to lose weight for the wedding. And I invested in a Peloton bike and I was so determined. I bought a smaller wedding dress. It wasn't an option. I had to, to, to lose the weight and get fit. And so every day, an hour, I was on the Peloton. Now I have never built, and I, I don't take lunch breaks and you know I don't do any of these things, but it was, but it, there was no choice. I had to get on that bike for an hour a day. And I did it at the end of the day. And it was, because I've always worked part from home and, and part sort of on the road between, between all the businesses and it was the end of the day. There was an actual end to the day. And it didn't necessarily have to be at six o'clock or seven o'clock. Sometimes there was things that just had to be done. It was but like it was a trigger. 7.30, 8 o'clock or 8.30, it was, okay, I'm done. I'm going on the bike and I'm going on the bike for an hour. And what that did to my relieve my stress to make me more focused, to make me more energized. It was the best work that I've ever done because I had that physical, you know, outlet, you know, of stress. Yeah. And, you know, when, I don't know whether you've ever been on a Peloton, it's a, it's a spin bike. And if you've ever been to a spin class, trust me, there's not much <laughs> thinking about anything else apart from trying not to die that yes. happens when you're spinning. So you are, you know, it's not like going for a gentle walk, which is still great, yeah. but you, your brain is still going. It was absolute mental switch off, enforced mental yeah. switch off from work. And exactly that, I was more focused. I had more energy. I, you know, once I did that, even if there was a deadline, and stuff needed to get done and I knew I was going to have to work really late that night I would still at six o'clock do an hour on the bike and then come back to it and that made a huge difference because I'd come back to it I'd be more energized you yeah. know I've, I've relieved some stress you know and so excuse me when I've when I've been forced I wouldn't have a wedding dress if I didn't do it forced to do it the difference that it made and the difference it made to my life to me but to my work as well yeah. and what you know organizations have to realize is that boundaries and it, you know um, encouraging people to take time for themselves will be the, for the benefit of the organization your people won't burn out they will work harder when they're in work they'll be happier they'll be more energized they also will be more the focused 100 percent. yeah because 100%. i think like it's... and i think yeah go ahead i think you know for the individual it's recognizing that it doesn't have to be a huge amount of time and yeah. even just at the end of the day having 
a bath, some candles, some music, a glass of wine, whatever it is, for 20 minutes. Yeah. And just having that alone time, you know, and going to bed 20 minutes later to make time for that is not going to make a huge difference to your life. It will probably help you sleep better. So it doesn't have to be, you know, a, a huge thing that takes all of this time. It can be small changes and, you know, um, eating better just, you know, during the day, having, I don't know, a fruit smoothie or some, some nuts and some fruit and things like that, you know, little things that can really just, just give you that energy and, and make a difference to your, to your well-being. Yeah, and also with time, you start to, like, I keep talking about baby steps. The best way how to change your life is by taking baby steps because they're not overwhelming. Um, I think many times people think that for me, and like, I can't blame them because like in movies, you see that this huge thing happens, huge event, and now they are a different person. But in reality, it doesn't work that way. You take small steps, you change tiny bits. And let's say even like the person you are today, it's a result of actions you took for last, like, let's say three years. And the person you will be in the future, let's say three, three years from now is from now is going to be based on what you action steps you take today. And it doesn't have to be huge. Like even like when it comes to physical activity um, or let's say willpower, um, I had uh, Maya Gutko on, she's also an executive coach, and she we were talking about the importance of mental health and willpower. And with willpower, um, I was reading that there's a science that if you just meditate for five minutes a day, you will increase your willpower. And your willpower plays really a big role in your like emotional control, um, your self-control, the way you um, control your behaviors and things like that whether you will take the cookie in the evening or you will not because in the evening your willpower is the lowest um, and it takes only five minutes because you the main thing is that during those five minutes some days you will just think about something but some days you will keep practicing this willpower muscle and it's like that with everything you do even like activities it doesn't have to be I don't know, four hours in the gym, like you can go for a walk. It's a start. You start to get in a habit of moving. Um, and in your case, you were forced to do it, which is another thing that <laughs> you just had to do it. And that's another thing that I tell people is that as long as it's optional, you will find a way not to do it. But if it's not optional, you will find a way to do it. Um, but then I think like, as you were speaking about those um, big rocks, what if, people have really limited flexibility in time like based on their work or they are strict hours and things like that how you manage those things then so that again is you know work and what we achieve in work is a big rock you know it is and you know we all have to pay our, our bills and our rent or a mortgage and so it is a huge part of our life but it's you know, if something's really important to you, if being a great mum or dad or being a great best friend or, um, you know, doing the marathon next year in a certain amount of time, if those are really important to you, you have to find time. You do, because nobody on their deathbed has said, I wish I worked harder. Yeah. I wish I worked more hours. I wish I worked more weekends. It just, it, it doesn't happen. Um, but yet they may say, I wish I'd seen my son grow up more. Or I wish I had appreciated that person before X, Y, and Z. And another thing that Stephen Covey talks about in the seven um, habits is pretend that you are at your 80th birthday and various different people in your life are standing up to to say some things about you yeah. what do you want them to say and what are you going to do to make that happen yeah. so you know you think about it and you say you know I want my um you know if I if I have an 80th birthday I want my daughter to stand up and say my mum has always been there for me and she has always given me time and we've got some great memories and this that and the other and therefore 
I need to make time for her because yeah. kids grow up in the blink of an eye. And, you know, it was the first thing that got sacrificed when I was um, working 60 hours a week in my corporate role. And I didn't see her for breakfast. I didn't have, you know, I'd get a note saying, can you read me a bedtime story? And I'd have to sort of shoo her away because I'm on a Zoom. And it was only coming out of that world that I realised that I neglected my priorities and those things that are really important to me. And unless you make time, you will, they will go by within a blink of an eye. Yeah, I think even how, I think many times people, people will say that it's important for them, but they will still prioritize their work. Like, I think what would help people to maybe open their eyes to like, like this exercise that you said, I have heard about it before as well. And I have told several people about it and it's a really good way how to look at it. But I think many times people still end up being like, yeah, I want to be like this. It, they might do it for like a week, but then they, they just stop um, or something really important comes up and they just get back in their like old ways where they prioritize their work, um, which is in a way it's ironic how how we things that we see are important that um technically a lot of times we do our job to be able to provide family or support them or to have these experiences with them but at the same time when we have a chance to actually have time with them we still choose the work so it's like really interesting how it works where like we sometimes when it comes to work you don't really question whether it's important or not you're just like, okay, work needs me, I'm there. But when it comes to your personal life or just taking care of yourself, a lot of times we just push that aside. <laughs> Absolutely. And this is where um, one of the, the key questions that I ask my clients quite early on in, in their coaching journey is what does success mean to you? How do you define success? And I believe, um, and this comes to the sort of Freudian psychology, which is, you know, everything is formed in our childhood and that sort of dictates, you know, everything. I don't agree with all of Freud's things, but in terms of success, I believe that you formulate that based on your childhood experiences and you take that through life. And actually, how often do you take a step back and go, okay, well, is that really what success looks like? And I'll give my own personal example, which was growing up, um, my my dad was very successful. Um, he had his own company. He had, you know, the, the title, the status, and, you know, financially did very well. So the, the salary and the job title but thinking that success was and you know well, that person's really successful because mm. they're the CEO and they've got a penthouse apartment in you know in Fitzrovia or what, wherever in central London and actually is that is that true is that really what I value as success and it's not and it was you know I want to be a great wife I adore my husband and you know, last year in the corporate world, he never saw me. And, you know, I, as I said, I wasn't around for, for my daughter. And actually success for me is, is having a great family and spending time with my family. And, you know, do I need that huge salary? Because actually what I value in my life doesn't cost any money. You know, yes, I want to pay the bills, and I want to be able to put fuel in the car and I want to get a takeaway on a Saturday night and, you know, go and see a film or something. And so success for me is having a work-life balance. Yeah. What's but all my life... For you to make that decision, because I think many times people know that, let's say, they, they want to have more time for a family, so they might take a different route, but it's it might be hard for them to let go because one thing is that it's just money but something else is that you have this like um 
persona that people identify you as that you're this like big person you have this like powerful position so that's not um it's not only the money that you let go it's also like pretty much part of your identity that people identify you as so what's what's the process there because i think um in a way like the way you explained it it's really simple but at the same time like when you actually are in that situation where you make that decision it's more than that amount of income that you let go of absolutely and just sort of finishing off about um you know my experience of success growing up my, i never saw my dad yeah ever he he left for work at 5 30 in the morning got home at 11 o'clock at night and he worked all weekend and yes we had lovely holidays and spent those two weeks in you know lovely places but you know it, it we didn't have you know time and you know he never read me a bedtime story and all of these things and you know I have a I have a good relationship with my dad I'm not saying that you know that's not okay because it is okay but for me success is not defined like that for me so it's you know it's figuring out what it means for you and if and if truly it is the the job title and the salary and you know working all the hours in, under the sun that's okay you know and it's also okay to recognize that that's not you know yeah. what 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 you deem success to be and it's interesting that you mention about the status and the title and how people see you because i'm working with two clients at the moment who have both gone from c suite um positions and are now do I want to you know they've they've left that through redundancy or um you know taking a step back or or what have you and now they're like okay well do do I want to go back to that because I'm being pulled towards doing consultancy or being self-employed but that's who I am and it took a lot of, of hard work on their part and unpacking to actually say, is, is that my whole identity? Does that make me who I am, my job title? No, it doesn't, you know, um, to them, you know, their, their husband, their friends, their children couldn't care less what their job title is. Yeah. Um, and somebody else working with said, oh, you know, well, what happens when, you know, my ex-employer looks on my LinkedIn and sees that I'm now not a C-suite role. I said, so, so what? So what? They, you don't know what they're going to be thinking and they're not going to give it much thought. It's not going to impact their life. They may think, oh, they're so lucky they're now self-employed and got a work-life balance and got off the, you know, the corporate (laughs) wheel. They may think, well, they didn't make much of it themselves, did they? And then they move on. But it's yeah. your life. You know, you're living this every day. And you cannot let what people think about you dictate, you know, yes, your family and your friends, but what other people think of you dictate what you do with your life. And you are so much more than your status in a company and it is a journey it you cannot change the way you think about yourself or you think about how other people are viewing you overnight it's not possible and when I left the corporate world um at middle of last year and that was what success was to me my you know my identity was you know the, the the big sort of job title there was this constant okay well I need to get another you know, I need to go back into it. I need to get the next big job title. And is that going to make me happy? Yeah. No. Simple question. It, yeah. <laughs> it, it really is. But it doesn't happen overnight because if that's been part of your identity for a really long yeah. time, it, it takes time to be okay with that. That yeah. that's no longer going to be part of my identity. But all of these things are. And... You know, but it's, I'm not saying that one is right and one is wrong. It's about what success means to you, what your priorities are, 
and what you want to achieve. Yeah, I think like, yeah, go ahead. You know, some CEOs of, 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 you know, massive companies who thrive on that and that's their whole life and they are happy with that. That's okay. But then as a leader, you've got to recognize where all your other people sit as well. And, you know, that can't be the culture of your organization that, you know, presenteeism is something that I talk about as well. You know, just because somebody's there all the time replying to emails and, you know, in the office till late and they're present doesn't mean they're working extra hard. It doesn't mean that they're more dedicated. You can have somebody who can do the same job in nine to five that somebody would take nine till 10 p.m., you know? And so it's recognizing what's right for you, but then as a leader, what is right for your your organization and your people as well. Yeah, like just as you said about that, like nine to five, I I was listening, um, I think Ferris, for our work week, where he said that a lot of times when he was working nine to five, he had some some kind of sales position with like calling executives. He said that the best time to call was before eight and after five. Those like one hour, 30, 60 minute windows, because that's when they didn't have their secretaries working there. So they could actually reach them directly. So he nice. said he got more business done in those like two hours or like even one hour than everybody else in nine to five. So it's not about even working more. It's about finding ways how to work efficiently where you get results. Because I think many times people focus on how much they are working or, and there's like, there was somebody who said that there's difference between you being busy and you being productive. I love that. (laughs) Absolutely, absolutely true. Absolutely true. And, you know, I, I've fallen into that and I have, been busy but I've actually achieved nothing at the end of the day and you know and everybody has has those moments and it's becoming it's about becoming efficient and working smart not hard although I don't completely um, agree with that but you know if you can build in efficiencies and you can you know make things happen between you know x time and y time or it works for you to work later or early or you know work out what what works for you and and he you know he did and so it doesn't fit into the norm normal yeah. sort of nine to five um and you know it it, it loops back around to that trust in your team as well and there was a post recently about on on linkedin about um you know people trusting their employees to work from home and it's very simple if you don't trust your employees to work from home you've hired the wrong people um you know because you've got to trust them and if you do and you build that trust through all the things that we were talking about earlier you can trust that they will get the work done and does it matter when they get it done or where they get it done you know, if they want to work from 11 o'clock in the morning till nine o'clock at night, or they want to work four o'clock in the morning till midday or whatever it is, um, I'm not sure why somebody would volunteer to work those hours, but, you know, and they get the work done, then that's what matters. And it's about, yeah. you know, quality of, of work and, you know, the work that they're achieving rather than the presenteeism of, you know, hours that, that they're visible and, just because they send an email at 3am in the morning doesn't mean that they're working harder than anyone else. Yeah. Or even like, let's say if they send it late, it doesn't mean that it's any less quality because I think everybody has different times when they are being productive. Um, If somebody can't wake up, but let's say, I don't know, eight to get at work at nine um, or six to get to work at like nine, whatever, however long they have to get however long it takes to get to the work like if if they show up and they are tired or they're not able to work you will not get that much out of it and it actually costs company the money so (laughs) they actually lose out absolutely and this is for organizations it's a mindset shift that you know being in the office for longer hours more days a week 
and you know pushing your people to the limit in the short term may get you quicker results but in the long term you're damaging your organization because you'll lose the good people you'll have the wrong culture and you know you won't have people aligned and, and, and working together you know and, and you'll burn out your your people and so longer term building in those boundaries celebrating those boundaries recognizing that people you know work in different ways but achieve the same results and building that into your culture will help the organization in the longer term so how you make sure you don't go too much to extreme where you give them too much freedom because i think that's like the other extreme that you don't want to give them too much freedom where they end up doing very little or they end up doing things last minute um so how not to go to the other extreme where one extreme is that you're being super strict you're pushing them to their limits but something else is that you give them too much freedom <laughs> that's where hire, hire the right people oh yeah and build the trust build those relationships because you know it, it's it's proven that for, for people to get the best out of their job they need to have autonomy autonomy mastery purpose and you know if you if you are having to oversee what they're doing or you have to question what they're doing when they're doing it they're not you know, you've not built, you know, you've not developed your people or hired the right people. You have to be able to, you know, hire the right people, build their capabilities, support people, develop people, and, you know, grow as they grow into the role and they take on more and that trust builds and off they go, you know, and you have to, you have to trust that, you know, people will will get things done and that they you know if if you don't are they right for the organization and are they do they have the right capabilities and you know and obviously you've got to have some structure in place um and i think having a balance of um working from home or working from the office and you know it it, it does go back to that that culture of of trust and you know and and developing the capabilities of your people yeah makes sense um another thing i wanted to ask you how you how you deal with people or like employees or even like conflict situations where let's say employees can't see my to eye they're good at their job they might be good at that with other like employees but they just can't see my to eye they just can't they just can't see my toy. They just can't. <laughs> You're always going to get different opinions, and not everybody is going to get on. Yeah. You know, people have have different personalities or clashing values, or you know, and you you're not going to be best buddies with with everyone. Yeah. But it's about encouraging people to be open minded and to actively listen to the other person and accept differences. You know, you're, you're not gonna like everyone and you're not gonna be the same as everyone. And everyone has strengths and lesser strengths and it's leveraging each other's strengths. And, you know, I used to say to, to, to team members who didn't get on, you, you don't have to like them, yeah. but you can still be professional and have professional interactions and still, you know, get to the end result. And yeah. it's okay to not get on with everybody, but it's not okay to not be professional. Yeah. So you always need to have respect for people and be professional. And if there is conflict, that's where it is part of the leader's job 
to mediate that conflict. And if they're not capable of doing it or they're too involved or, you know, they, they have the same opinion as one and not the other, then that's where you can get external people, coaches or, um, you know, trainers or the HR department who can help with that mediation and bringing people around to exactly that, accept that you have different opinions. It's not about convincing one that the other is right or vice versa. <laughs> it's about celebrating the different opinions again because that's where innovation comes from because yeah. if everybody thinks the same has the same ideas you're never going to innovate you know it, it's and you're never going to test those innovations either and so yeah that conflicts will happen they do it's a fact of life um i've had to mediate a few um in in my past and you know, it, if, if you're not comfortable as a leader doing that, then there's plenty of external and internal support that, that you can get. And sometimes it takes an outsider to come in and be impartial. Yeah. And if you are in a conflict yourself, you know, do seek advice and support. Go to your mentor if you have a great relationship with your line manager or speak to you know HR um, to get that support in, in moving that relationship forward. Always make sure it's not you know you reach out to them for support and it's not you just end up complaining about that person. Yeah. Um, but you know that you want support in in building a, a better relationship because if neither of you are going to leave the company, you've got to work together. Yeah. So you've got to figure this out. Um, so yeah, recognizing that it's okay to not be best friends with everyone, but that you can be professional and you can get support to, you know, mediate as well. Yeah. I think like what you said that what came in my mind is that you don't have to like somebody to respect them. Like you don't even like when it comes to, and I have helped people with like communication and some arguments, it's not like only in business, but like in relationships or people they know, family. And a lot of times what happens is, is that, as you said, like we, we think that we are, we have the one right perspective, like the other person doesn't understand, which sometimes it's true. Sometimes you do know better, but it's not always the case. And I think really good way how to approach it is to try to understand where they are coming from because they have reason for thinking the way they do. So like once you, as long as you stay curious, you can actually, um, you can understand them and you come less from perspective of like your ego wanting to be right. And I'm always right and things like that. But because like uh, the moment you say somebody that they're wrong, they, they are closing off. They're not going to listen to you anymore because you just told them that they're living wrong or the way they see things are wrong. So it's really about understanding how they how they think and where they're coming from. And that's where you can, you don't have to agree, which is another thing. It, I'm not saying that you have to agree with what they're thinking. You just have to understand and then be, okay, like you think this, I think I think this, we can just stay there, that that's okay. Like, I, yeah. I don't, you don't have to agree with me. I don't need you to agree yeah. with me. It's okay to have different opinions. A hundred percent. And I love the phrase that you use, stay curious. Yeah. I really like that. Um, and absolutely right. If if you tell somebody that they are wrong, <laughs> the, the wall comes up, yep. the defense mechanisms come up, and you might as well just call it quits on the conversation yeah. there and then because you are not going to convince them otherwise at that point. Yeah. It is about, you know, having an interesting conversation about your differing points of view. And that yeah. comes down to communication styles and recognizing other people's communication yeah. styles and, 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 and things like that. But um, I... I've learned a lot from my husband because I, I used to be um, quite direct on my, my plans. He definitely um, taught me the art of, you know, 
recognizing that you know really exactly as you said stay curious and seek to understand where they're coming from yeah. and where those opinions are coming from because you'll learn something you yeah. will learn something and you know being open to that as well being open to the fact that you may be wrong yeah exactly I was about to say that you might end up understanding that actually you're right <laughs> yeah and and you know other other people's opinions you know being curious about that you'll learn so much you know because it may be that they have you know read a scientific paper that actually supports this way of thinking or you know they might have recently you know spoken to somebody directly or and you know getting other people's um opinions and insights and you know learning about them and developing them and and learning more um, around subjects and things like that will shape and develop your own opinions yeah. going forward because if you have opinions based on not much um, they're not going to stand up to much yeah. and it's about having those conversations with other people that will shape and develop how you view things going forwards I think when it comes to curiosity, one thing that a lot of times is blocking it is ego. Because when you think you know everything, you're really closed off from like um, learning or being open to other people's perspective. But also like when you when you start to achieve more and you get to a higher level, a lot of times it gets in your head, even as a leader. So like what would be good ways how to approach it where like it doesn't get in your head? Because it's really important that thing to stay humble as you keep walking upstairs because if you don't treat your people right or you always think that you're the the I don't know you're the right one because you have this position somebody will bypass you and <laughs> it will come back to you but like Absolutely. I think ego is a big one it is and you're exactly right it will it will come back to you um and uh, what was the f there's a phrase of be nice to everyone as as you go up the ladder because you're past them when you fall or or something yeah. like that. But you know, having you know genuine respect for other humans. Yeah. You know, it just because you have. A CEO title or you drive a Maserati I don't mind pointing outside because I certainly don't have a Maserati on the driveway yeah. but just because you have that or you have that it makes you better than no one else yeah things do not define what you're like as a person yeah and if you if, if that's how you view yourself at some point you will come crashing down yeah because it's not reality what you said about and... that I, I will quickly jump in like what you said about that um i had uh, my mentor say me that nothing and everything is the same thing it really made me think because we are the one who we are the ones who are actually adding that value to that everything that you have or nothing that you have because that at the end of the day, you are still you, whether you have all these like luxury car cars and like your castles and things, or you have nothing. Um, so like, that's, that's one thing that really made me think that nothing and everything is the same thing. I'm going to think about that because that's yeah. quite a big <laughs> thing to take away yeah, and, and still think, think about that. I, I have written it on this the book. The mind blowing concept. A hundred percent. And you know, kindness, kindness costs nothing. And, you know, you are no better than any other person. And the thing I think as you get older, you realize that everybody has their own story, you know, and you can learn something from everybody. Yeah. And strip away the, the suit and the fast car and the, the, you know, big job title and, you know, and put you in a room with somebody else, you're on an equal playing field. That doesn't make you better than anyone else. And I think, you know, and I'm, and I'm 
certainly not implying that everybody has a big ego. Um, you know, there are there are some people who who don't have all those things and have big yeah. egos as well. But it will come back to bite you. And yeah. you know, you really want to get the most out of life, out of meeting new people, out of your relationships, out of your friendships, because you're not you know curious or open to learn about other people and you know what they think and and feel and and everybody's opinions are equally valid if I won't say that to my husband too loudly if my husband is I'm just kidding (laughs) yeah well I think like even people that don't seemingly don't have any eager problems they definitely especially if they are like high achievers or they are in like pretty high positions they definitely have done a lot of work with their ego because it takes a lot of work not to allow that to get in your head, no matter how humble you are. I think there are some points when you're like, oh, I achieved this. So, <laughs> you know, um, but like that's something that I I, I have seen with, with many people that that importance of, and it's, it's really a powerful place to be where no matter how much you achieve, it doesn't get in your head. You still keep yeah, striving I- forward. I think I think you're right you know it is you need to have reality checks and you need people around you that keep you grounded you do and you know there's nothing wrong with celebrating your successes and you know and people around you celebrating them as well you know um and that's you know that's okay because you've put a lot of work into achieving something and you know, but recognizing other people's successes and achievements. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's okay to, to, to be proud of, of who you are and what you've achieved and what you know and the relationships you have. But it's about not losing respect for other people's yeah. achievements and successes. And that it doesn't make you better that's where the ego comes in you know you can be proud of who you are and celebrate what you've achieved and celebrate your successes and not lose respect for other people and what they have achieved at the same time yeah like that I think that's where all the talk about that that rich people are arrogant are coming from that (laughs) in a way like there there might be a few people that are that way and now people think that um, and I think that's that's a lot of times when, when we're talking about success, um, many people might, and I have seen people with like limiting beliefs about success, that they feel like they don't deserve it or it's bad to be successful because of these like, I don't know, in a way, social conditioning that they get with their like upbringing when they learn that money is bad or success is bad or successful people are arrogant, they don't care about others and things like that. Yeah, I mean, that's where bias comes in. And I was actually reading on, um, again, LinkedIn this morning, an article that there are 184 different bias that we can have, which is huge. Um, And part of the um, MBA Essentials course I did recently was was learning about bias, recognising them and really taking that, you know, How do you recognise them? learn about them read about them and take that time to self reflect because mm. I learned about certain biases I'd never heard of before yeah. and you know and it, and it takes real honesty and introspection to to actually recognize that yeah. this may be at play here um and you know and and try and not exercise judgment on other people and it goes you know it goes both ways you know just because you have money doesn't make you better than anyone else but just because you've fought and you don't have money doesn't make you better than them yeah. either um and it's about you know taking stock and taking that time for self-reflection as you said about the social conditioning and what you've been sort of brought up to believe. And, and that goes back to what I was saying about success that I yeah. was brought up to view that as success. And it was only then as an adult, I went on a journey on a process of redefining what success actually 
you know, looks like for me. Yeah. And if people define their success as the salary and, you know, the, the, the job title and status, that's okay, you know? And if, if people judge it on something else, that's okay as well. And not having those, those judgments and those bias. And I think it's also um, important to know what is your success, not what other people around you or your family, because I think that's a lot of times where, um, like a lot of times we, we determine what success is based on what our family thinks success is or our like peers or friends and things like that. So it's important to understand what is success for you not for somebody else. Absolutely. And it's really interesting you say that because, again, I'm working with a client at the moment around what they, you know, view success to be and family members get mentioned yeah. quite a lot. Um, and I, you know, I have experienced the same, same thing um, of what, you know, my family having grown up the same view of success previously um and you know that that's it's just about learning to be okay with it because at the end of the day you're the one who has to get up every morning and live your life and they are not and you know if you are you know working on yourself and and what you view as success and you come to terms with that do you know what it may not align with what your family or your friends think but if you're okay with it and you are you know really clear on on what success is for you and how you're going to get there that will fade to become less and less important but you're absolutely right it has to be what you want and yeah. not what you think other people view success as yeah I like that's that's something that I I have experienced a lot myself even like when I so I have finished bachelor's in sports psychology and when I said my dad I want to study psychology he wasn't too happy he wanted me to go more in like uh, business and things like that which I am interested in but my main thing has always been like psychology, understanding humans, human nature and things like that. Um, but like one thing that I, I learned um, with people in general, when I was trying to get people to understand my perspective on things was accepting that it's okay if you don't understand me. Like having not having that expectation that you have to understand me um, and then being okay with like not them understanding Um, because a lot of times we we want to get this like connection that somebody really understands us Um, but learning to be okay if they don't um, I think that's that that has been a big lesson it's been like in a way a relief that you're like oh my gosh it's okay that they don't understand like that's fine (laughs) absolutely and I was working with a client yesterday and she was talking about her strengths and what she called weaknesses, which are actually just lesser strengths. Yeah. And, oh, you know, I've got to work on this because I'm not very good at this. And I was like, but that's, that's okay. It's, it's, you know, I'm terrible at Excel and the analytical part of my brain is virtually non-existent. Yeah. Um, I'm people focused and hopefully people <laughs> that naturally comes out but it's sitting down analyzing spreadsheets obviously I had to do it in my previous role but for you know populating those spreadsheets or what have you and you know that the offer is to to go on a course and upskill in that no thank you because I'm okay there are so many people that's their strength that's what they love doing so tap into that and I'm okay with not being you know great at that and she suddenly was like yeah it is you know okay it is okay to to be the way that that I am and you know have strengths and and lesser strengths because you're never going to be good at everything um I think that's like perfectionism where it's like I think it takes a lot to be able to admit that you know what it's okay if I'm not great at this because many times, especially high achievers, they want to be great at pretty much like everything. 
and it's it's really hard to be great at everything because mainly you will be great at one thing if you are like deliberately working on developing that skill but it takes a lot to be able to let go and be like you know what this is not my thing um i'm okay not being strong in this area and you you, you use the word relief yeah and honestly letting go of things that are not you know hugely important to you or you know that you're not you know there's no need to be great at everything there are so many other people that have you know strengths in other areas and that's where collaboration comes in and celebrating their strengths as well and that all goes back to, to leadership but you know the relief of going I'm not great at that and that's and that's okay because I'm great at all of these other things. And this is where, you know, I focus my time and my energy. Yeah. And also like letting go of that opinion of others. I think that's, that's something that takes a lot. And I think it, I think it's always a work in progress to let go of that because you always hear other people's opinions and how they think you should live your life, (laughs) especially like the closest ones, because you really they, they are really, they're playing a really important role in your life. So you naturally want to be accepted by them. But um, letting go that um, that want or need to be accepted and being like, it's okay if you don't understand me, it takes like a lot of courage, I think. Huge, huge. And, you know, we can, we can all say, you know, we're great at that. But it yeah. is a work in progress. It is yeah. absolutely a work in progress because if we were not affected by other people's opinions and wants, needs, likes, we wouldn't be human. Yeah. You know, no person can tell me that they ha- have no care what anybody else thinks about them or what, you know, how they view you or, yeah. you know, if they can they have done a lot of work on themselves (laughs) yeah absolutely and there's always you know there is always more um but it is you know it is it's hard you know and these things do take time and everything that we've we've talked about today you know from culture change to to leadership to boundaries to you know mental health all of these things are uh, are a process and they take time change doesn't happen overnight but it's building that awareness around where you need to tweak things where you need to focus where you need to be okay yeah. um and, and just continuing to to work on that and you know getting other people to support you in that in that process whether that be you know a therapist a coach a mentor a friend um you know, recognizing that that no man is an island, and yeah. you know, it's it's just about that awareness of what will help you to work on and who can support you to do that. Yeah, I think with this also comes in putting yourself first, um, what you mentioned before, and actually like taking care of yourself first, and actually thinking about what is the most important thing for you because. Like you're the only person that you will have to live with your whole life. Like it's it's quite a while to live with somebody and you're the only person who will know what it is that you want. And you're the only person who will feel all the guilt for things you didn't do or things you gave up just to please somebody else. Um, but like, I think it takes a lot to actually, for me, it took a while to actually start to put myself first and not feel guilty for that. Because that was a big thing. When you start to put yourself first, you start to feel bad about doing it, especially your pe- if you're a people pleaser, which I'm recovering people pleaser. So um, <laughs> it, it takes a lot to actually say no or put yourself first and not apologize or explain that. If you don't have time, sorry, I don't have time and not explain why. Uh, that is a huge thing to master you know absolutely and again that's a working progress but if you recognize that you are a people pleaser and it's having a detriment on you you're halfway there you know recognizing that as an area to and work admitting and that then as well yeah 
Absolutely. And I always think about it in terms of, um, you know, on an airplane, when they say if oxygen masks come down and, you know, you've got a child next to you yeah. and to put yours on first and then help the child. And, and our natural instincts for, for the vast majority, all of people would be, OK, I've got to sort them out. But then you're going to run out of oxygen yourself and they may have their mask on but you're you know it's it's about you know and, and sometimes you have to prioritize somebody somebody yeah, else of course you know but you're exactly right you have you've got to live with yourself for the rest of your life and yeah. you have to wake up every morning and also doing that exercise of your 80th birthday who do I want to be then what do I yeah. want to have achieved what you know values you know do I want to live my life by um and being you know being okay with that yeah and also like when you that was a big lesson for me when I was actually putting myself first and I was doing a lot of work on myself I was actually able to help people without trying to help them because they would like I, I was being like an example for them and they would see like, oh, you're doing this. I might as well try to do this. And in a way, like if you don't take care of yourself, it's way harder for you to take care of others because like you're pretty much running on your last batteries trying to help everybody else. But if you take care of yourself first, you naturally just feel more like positive and you enjoy more helping others. You don't feel like it's draining. Absolutely. And you then have more to give. Yeah, exactly. As I said about, you know, work, if you're working all the time, you're never going to bring your best self. Yeah, you know, and if you if you give to everybody all the time, you're never going to give your best self. Yeah, definitely. Well, I, I somehow started this um, little thing, where at the end, this is like the third episode where I ask, for you to give some wisdom in the end. Um, it can be about anything, just something that comes in your head, something you learn, something you want others to um, keep in mind. Wow, okay, I don't, I don't think I've ever thought of myself as having wisdom, um, but I can talk about something um, that I was talking about this morning, which is going back to the work of your strengths. Yeah. And actually, the people that are most happy in their lives, achieve the most, and are engaged in the work the most, are those that focus on their strengths yeah. and not improving their weaknesses. Yeah. So recognizing that you're not great at something, do I need to be great at this? Or is it okay? And focusing on you know where your your strengths are and that will really develop you um and help you you know succeed yeah. to whatever you believe success to be yeah exactly well thank you for coming on this conversation was awesome not to say more um but yeah thank was... you so much for 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 having me on and you know, when we when we discussed a couple of weeks ago about coming on, you said, oh, two hours goes past in a flash. And it <laughs> really has. And I've absolutely loved having this conversation. Um, it, yeah, it's on. Yeah, well, thank you for coming. And I might get you on another time. And because I think we, we will never run out of conversations or topics to talk about. <laughs> absolutely well I'd, I'd be delighted and I can talk for England about anything and everything so yeah I'd be delighted all right okay thank you for coming thank you